Okay. Um, welcome, everybody, to the first colloquium of this academic year. I'm Krishna Lewis, the fellowship director at the Du Bois Institute at the Hutchins Center at Harvard. <laughs> And I'm really happy that we're back in person again. We have a wonderful colloquium series. <laughs> and the colloquium series is wonderful because we have an amazing cohort of fellows as well as fantastic guest speakers. And with that, I'd like to give the podium over to David Harris. He's the director emeritus of the Charles Hamilton Houston Institute for Race and Justice. Please welcome David. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's only for Donald that I come back on this campus. So, <laughs> so and I'm honored to be here today. Uh, Donald is a, a, a Donald Yakovon is a friend, a colleague, and a neighbor, uh, and. I've been fortunate to be Donald adjacent during the production of this book, and uh, it's, it's been quite a ride for, for those of us who have been near him. I'm going to, not going to go into his background a lot. You know, you, you know his credentials, you know he, his connection to Harvard, you know his work with Professor Gates, and uh, I also I'm going to kind of hype the book because it, you'll learn a lot more if you look at the book. Okay. Um, so I, I just want to give a couple of stories. For several years, my colleague Marty Blatt and Donald and I used to meet for lunches. We'd get to the lunches and we'd debrief, we'd talk about, focus on various travails we have, personal and private. And Donald would arrange these lunches around uh, to coincide with his trips to the library. Uh, and he'd share some of his findings that he was, that he was find, that what he was finding, and it was clear that his hours in the library uh, were a tonic for him. He was enthralled by his work. As an aside, in the acknowledgments for the book, Donald gives a special shout out to the libraries, and I just want to confirm from our lunches that I know that that's heartfelt and earnest. He really does. Uh, so he came to several lunches uh, and uh, uh, at once animated and distressed uh, by what he was finding during what he thought would be a supplementary task for his project. Little did we know at the time we were witnessing the gestation of this book. Uh, Donald has many strengths, one of which is his ability to be distracted. <laughs> but his, distract his distractions turn into valuable products. Indeed, even as he was working on this book, uh, he took time out to pursue research on Lloyd Boynton, a neglected African-American artist. I was fortunate enough to take a photo of, of the work for him, but the resulting article was rejected by an established art journal with this explanation. Ch catch this. Your subject is fascinating and timely. Your study is well constructed and thorough. <laughs> While the narrative that you provide is convincing and elegant, all that said, with its biographical and celebratory tone, it is not suitable for a more specialized journal than the lofty <laughs> journal he is. I can't think of a better jacket note for his current book. <laughs> And I'm hoping he understands this myopic rejection of his affirmation that some of history of black people can and should be celebratory, and that such work belongs in all scholarly journals. <laughs> Teaching white supremacy is also fascinating, timely, well-constructed, and thorough, and the narrative convincing and elegant, as they said. But the book, while true to the historical standards, is also informed and written with passion. Here, more somber than celebratory. Donald also made time to take a dive into the work of Raoul, I can never pronounce his first name, Dahl, whose Charlie and the Chocolate Factory has been a staple for youngsters who have absorbed the underlying racism of the book. In another well-researched and eloquently written essay, Innocence Betrayed, Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, and the deep roots of white supremacy, Donald gave a, a precursor of this work. And he said, Dahl's book did not exist in a vacuum. For, worse than, for far worse white supremacist views appeared in school history and geography books, in pamphlets and newspapers. But Dahl's work helped perpetuate supremacist ideology with ingenious imagination depicted 
Africans as an ignorant, savage people, best suited for enslavement, whose lives were most improved by subordination to white people as slaves. In sharing, in sharing these, in these examples, I want to introduce Donald Yakovon as a worthy and accomplished scholar whose work reveals what are to me three critical attributes of historians, curiosity, determination, and hope. Donald is incredibly curious. He sees and reads and asks questions. He, he wants to know what's going on below and behind. He wants to get to the core, to the meaning of something. And once having scratched the surface, he is determined to get to that core. He is methodical and thorough, but also guided by the light of a moral compass that points toward justice. Finally, and perhaps most important, Donald approaches his work with that most important quality, hope. No matter how dark the subject matter, and this subject matter is dark, uh, Donald has that abiding belief that history may not set us free, but it can be the basis for change. That, it is, that if the truth of the past is placed before us, we can find our way out of the darkness. When I finished reading the book, I sent Donald a simple email, breathless and heartbroken. I was breathless at the sweep of the, and brilliance of the work, heartbroken by what it revealed about us. I went on to say the epilogue had been particularly depressing, particularly his finding that the, despite the improvement from the 1960s, he says, the way we teach history in public schools remains as lifeless as John Brown's body. It's not funny. I mean, it's sad but true. Uh, Donald's response was telling, though. He said, overcoming the past is hard. Germany seems to have done a little better job separating the past from, than we have. We, har we have hardly tried. They had no choice. But, he said, there are signs of life in that closing, sort of. Indeed, there are several passages in the book where Donald discusses others in terms that I would apply to him. He says of historian Albert Bushnell Hart, quote, as a scholar, he sought balance and detachment. But when it came to the history of slavery, he concluded that it could have existed only with blood, iron, and tears. And he spoke of the lively prose and diligence that only a scholar could bring to the task when describing Edward Shannon. So it is for this, so it is for this book. Let us hope that it will be read and absorbed across the country and become part of a true awakening. Finally, let me say, I also learned a bit about Donald in the acknowledgments that include the fact that he met his beloved wife, Mary, uh, on the Green Line. <laughs> now, only a romantic, true romantic, can find love on the tee. <laughs> but Donald and I solidified our, our friendship on those rides of the 94 from West Medford into Davis Square. A scholar and a gentleman, my dear friend, Donald Yacobone, teaching white supremacy. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, be careful what I say to him from now on. <laughs> The past matters, especially now. The Wisconsin-born Frederick Jackson Turner, who spent many unhappy years teaching history here at Harvard, can only uh, <clears throat> observed in 18, 1891 <laughs> that, to, quote, today is so much a product of yesterday that yesterday can only be understood as it is explained by today. For the present is simply the developing past, the past the undeveloped present. Far too many Americans, as the famed author and critic James Baldwin explained in The Fire Next Time, remain trapped in that past, which they do not understand. And until they understand it, they cannot be released from it. But we may have underestimated the challenge of releasing Americans from their past, because as Baldwin emphasized, Quote, the danger in the minds of most white Americans is the loss of their identity. And this is the primary underlying issue confronting us today. The profound base layer that is now cracking and perceived as being washed away by the developing present. 
It is, to many, a terrifying loss of the known universe, an attack, as Baldwin wrote, on one's sense of one's own reality. Teaching white supremacy is an exploration into the origins, development, and perpetuation of the idea of white American national identity. The, this consciousness has been at the core of American culture since colonial times and has driven our history to the present day. It has been the lens through which we have perceived the world and ourselves. Baldwin recalled that as a child, quote, I was taught in American history books that Africa had no history and that neither had I. I was a savage about whom the least said the better and who had been saved by Europe and who had been brought to America. After school, he returned home and thought, oh, of course, that this was an act of God. You belong where white people put you. And it always has been so. Harvard professor Sarah Lewis explained that when her grandfather was a young student in 1926, he had asked his teacher why no black people appeared in his history textbook. The teacher advised him that African Americans, quote, had done nothing to merit inclusion. The influential New York Times journalist, Charles Blow, explained that when he was young, quote, I was led to believe blackness was inferior. We had been trained in it, bathed in it, acculturated to hate ourselves. At every turn, at every moment, I was being baptized in the narrative that everything white was right, good, noble, and beautiful, and everything black was not. The bitter influence lay everywhere, even in the, as he said, blue-eyed white Jesus hanging over your bed. The experience of black high school students in my own community of Medford two years ago reinforced Blow's account. A local branch of the NAACP, along with students, protested school curriculum and the punishments handed out to black students. I am not going to lie, one young woman exclaimed. Going to high school, quote, made me hate being black. Despite 60 years of dedicated modern scholarship, the long heroic civil rights movement, an endless social and political commentary in too many painful ways. Little has changed since the African-American scholar Charles Wesley surveyed history school curriculum in 1925. The black student, he wrote, is made to, quote, realize that his badge of color in America is a sign of subjugation, inferiority, and contempt. Just in the last few years, in classrooms in Vermont, New York, New Jersey, Ohio, Virginia, Tennessee, Mississippi, and Florida. Black students have been compelled to stand in front of their white classmates as slaves to be auctioned off to the highest bidder. Such curricular violence, as one black Vermont parent wailed, is hardly unique. For 10 years, students in a New Jersey fifth grade class had to create slave auction advertisements. In Watertown, New York, the teacher of a fourth grade class ordered a black boy and girl to stand in front of their white classmates with their hands behind their backs, just as in, quote, slave times. And the winning bidder would be their master. The teacher then announced that if these slaves tried to escape, quote, they would be chased down and violence would be done to them. An investigation of the incident revealed lasting emotional harm to the two students. When a similar event took place in Ohio, an Ohio fifth grade class, a mother objected, understandably, but her complaints were dismissed. She was told that this, quote, this activity was part of the state's required curriculum. In Florida, a teacher assured his students that the N-word just means ignorant. Minnesota fifth graders in a lesson plan right out of the 1920s learned that African Americans regretted the end of slavery because, quote, the enslavers took care of them and gave them food and clothing. In Rhode Island, students received absolutely no exposure to the history of slavery until high school, and even then it amounted to a one paragraph statement. In Oregon, a teacher advised a group of biracial students who had acted up at lunchtime that, quote, 
You're lucky I'm not taking, making you pick cotton and clean my house. A, teach, a Texas teacher advised his students that if the South had won the Civil War, all the black students in the class would be slaves. Until 2019, Texas textbooks described slaves as, quote, imported workers. And secession, not slavery, had caused the Civil War. And now the state of Texas has banned about 800 books related to slavery, race, sexuality, abortion, and a host of related issues, including the work by one Henry Louis Gates, Jr. <laughs> In 2020, the New York Times reported that medical students and residents in the Duke University survey remain convinced that African Americans have thicker skin and less sensitive nerve ending endings the same vile garbage that Harvard's biolog biologist and ethnologist Louis Agassiz spewed across the United States in the 19th century. In May 2019, when a large group of African American seventh graders visited the Boston Museum of Fine Arts, staff informed them that in the museum they could have no food, no water, and no watermelon. Black subordination and white privilege remain a burning legacy of what we have been teaching our children. Confederate flags swayed during the January 6, 2021 assault on the United States Capitol building and American democracy, but such emblems can be diverting symbols, tempting viewers to shrug off racial oppression as something as, ex as extinct as the Confederacy and Southern slavery. Far from it, the gallows with its wretched noose erected outside the Capitol spoke much louder. While many wistful Americans hailed Barack Obama's 2008 election as the end of the ASEAN regime, almost an equal number woke up the following morning in shock. The election of an African American president, twice no less, became the harbinger of profound change, one that jeopardized white identity and supremacy. The number of white Americans feeling overwhelmed, disparaged, and dispossessed only increased with each passing day. As the New Yorker magazine writer and Harvard historian Jill Lepore observed in 2010, many whites felt the shocking sensation that Obama's election, quote, had ripped a tear in the fabric of time as if affirming Newton's third law of physics that for every action there's an equal and opposite reaction, national politics responded with the election of the great white demagogue. Anxious whites rode up, rose up in 2016 to elect someone who would re-empower them, even if only symbolically. White men in America believed that, quote, their voice wasn't being heard. Vanderbilt University professor of sociology and medicine, Jonathan Metzl, observed, Trump gave them their voice back. In the fall of 2016, as the former president of the, United, of the Organization of American Historians, Earl Lewis related, the prospect of a Donald Trump victory had inspired those whites suffering from a perceived sense of lost dignity, status, and respect with new hope. They saw him, they saw in him, rather, a renewal of white supremacy and black subordination. Trump would, as one white New Yorker informed an African-American woman who grabbed the last seat on a subway car, would put people like her, quote, back in the fucking fields. I had begun this book project intending to write about the legacy of the anti-slavery movement, historical memory, and the rise of the modern civil rights movement. But when I started examining the, that legacy in the nation's textbooks, initially sparked by the collection of about 3,000 at the now sadly defunct Special Collections Department at the Gutman Library, I was stunned by what I found. It carried me off in a wholly unexpected direction into a different book. And this research gave me insight into what instruction and what priorities were leaping from those pages into the brains of the children compelled to read them. It also proved surprisingly personal. At the Gutman Library, I shockingly found Exploring the New World, which had been assigned 
in my 1962 fifth grade social studies class in Saratoga, California. <laughs> Reprinted repeatedly between 1953 and 1965, this textbook had been adopted by schools around the United States. As I opened its still crisp white pages, my gasp must have jolted those working near me. It all came rushing back. Somehow I had never forgotten the image of Eli Whitney in this book, but not there because he had invented the cotton gin, but allegedly for inventing, inventing the concept of interchangeable parts, thus laying the groundwork for industrialization. Exploring the New World never mentioned the anti-slavery movement. Slaves, on the other hand, proved necessary to pick cotton. Quote, who else would do the work, the authors asked. At the same time, however, the textbook also stated that people of the North did not believe that men and women should be, quote, bought and sold. But exploring the New World followed the same pattern set at the close of the 19th century, seeking sectional reconciliation regarding issues related to slavery and the Civil War. Its authors also wished to avoid cultural strife and the reality of slavery and racism and promote national unity amidst the Cold War in the early 1960s by asserting that, the, that during the Civil War, everyone was brave, everyone fought for principle, everyone white, that is, and General Robert E. Lee represented all that was noble, gallant, and heroic in American society. Quote, his name is now loved and respected in both North and South. We know that he was not only a gallant Southern hero, but a great American. That textbook, and nearly all the ones I had read, was not published by a Southern segregationist press, and certainly not by the Klan or any other far-right publishers, uh, uh, although those presses did emerge in the 1920s and still operate online. No, the thousands of textbooks that have stained the minds of generations of students from the elementary grades to college were produced almost entirely by northern publishing houses situated, situated mostly in Boston, New York, or Chicago and crafted by northern trained scholars and education specialists. Indeed, several of the most famous and influential American historians of the first half of the 20th century nearly all trained at northern colleges and universities, produced some of the most racist texts I had the displeasure to read. These textbooks inspired me to rethink the trajectory of American history and culture. And for, the most, and for most of them, excuse me, there was nothing subtle about the approach. One 1930 textbook began on the very first page with a screaming title at the top, in capital letters, the white man's history. No matter what non-English speaking people had done in America, as one 1918 textbook assured students, quote, the forces that have shaped that life have been English. We possessed a fixed identity, the book asserted, one inherited from Great Britain. Another, a child's history of the United States, insisted that early US history was the record of the white man's progress over the godless red savage. Slavery and African Americans had no place in this 1856 text. Across two centuries and with precious few exceptions, African Americans in these textbooks appeared, if they appeared at all, and mostly they didn't, only as a problem, only as, quote, ignorant Negroes, as slaves, not people, and as anonymous abstractions that only pose, quote, problems for the real subjects of this written history, people of European descent. As one 1914 school book typically asserted, the black man, quote, became a problem that it took many years to solve. This assumption of white identity, white domination, and white importance underlie every chapter and every theme of the thousands of textbooks that blanketed the schools of our country. This vast tectonic plate still underlies American culture and must be the central concern for every one of us. And while the very worst features of those textbooks, of the textbook legacy, have ended, the themes, facts, and attitudes of, white, of supremacist ideologies 
are deeply embedded in our national identity, in what we teach and how we teach it. Even our very youngest students, if Roland Dahl's Charlie and the Chocolate Factory is any indication, become indoctrinated in these principles as soon as they start to read. Responsibility for this consciousness of exclusion, this enduring identity of true Americans as only descendants of white Europeans, rests broadly and profoundly in our history, and only history can explain how and why. Principles of white supremacy have been central to the American experience and predate creation of the American Republic and actually help shape, actually help shape a commitment to democratic republicanism, republicanism that later emerged. Samuel Sewell, the legendary 17th century judge of the Salem witchcraft trials, expressed the essence of how white Americans would later understand their national identity. Ignoring all evidence to the contrary, early American settlers and, of course, their descendants understood their new communities as special divinely inspired creations of Europeans for European descendants. The people of African descent who lived and moved among them, and of course Native Americans, especially in New England, would always be outsiders, undesired foreign objects, no matter how respected, even admired, some people of African descent might be. As Sewell noted in his diary, they would always remain separate, distinct, outside the mainstream of American life. Sewell, who in 1700 crafted the selling of Joseph, the nation's first anti-slavery pamphlet, had denounced slavery, he had denounced slavery as un an unchristian uh, scourge, sorry, and reminded New Englanders that he, quote, he hath made of one blood nations of men. Yet, as he would be, as would become commonplace among later Northerners. Sewell also explained that African Americans, quote, still remain in our body politic as a kind of extravasant blood. What, what was that extravasant blood. They remained for Sewell and his fellow settlers forever outside the regular veins and capillaries of society, unnerved by the mere presence of Africans in New England, he wondered if people like himself would retain their cherished whiteness, quote, after the resurrection. This assertion of a people who exist outside of mainstream white consciousness set the pattern that would remain with us to this very day. Most contemporary public attention, if it considers the subject at all, understands this, the persistence of racism as a legacy of Southern slavery. But in the end, the ideology of slavery is only a subset of the larger, more enduring, and specifically Northern ideology of white supremacy. From Samuel Sewell's time to the blossoming, excuse me, of white supremacists in the 19th century, it has been Northern thinking that has propelled racial subordination, not just defenders of slavery and Southern resistance to reconstruction and opposition to the civil rights movement. In every important field of thought and culture, it has been Northerners, especially those from New England and New York, who have most aggressively advanced the suppression of African Americans and, cre and creation of the ideology of white supremacy, a term first popularized by the Canadian-born New Yorker John H. Van Every. Oh, sorry, that's him. One of the nation's most important white supremacists and the least known, Van Every became the nation's first professional racist, best known for his repellent books, Negroes and Negro Slavery, Subgenation, and White Supremacy and Negro Subordination. His publishing house in the heart of Manhattan also published a novel, poetry, and in 1866, an outlandish school textbook by his business partner, Rushmore G. Horton. 
Historians mostly recall Van Every for his two newspapers, the New York Day Book, which he retitled the Weekly Caucasian when, Lincoln, when the Lincoln administration shut all the uh, newspapers down that promoted treason and disloyalty, and the Old Guard, a monthly journal devoted to the principles of 1776 and 1787. A maliciously inspired marketing genius who popularized the terms white supremacy and master race Van Every it was a toxic combination of Joseph Goebbels, Steve Bannon, and Rupert Murdoch, and helped shape modern white ideology, supremacist ideology. Few Americans in the 19th century who read a newspaper failed to see an endorsement of his publications or one of his many countless advertisements. He even reviewed his own books, it's like Whitman. Few Americans in the mid-19th century who read a newspaper failed to see an endorsement of his publications or one of his countless advertisements. His inventive and revol revolting racial theories translated the new ethnological science of men like uh, Harvard's Louis Agassiz to an eager public. He aimed his diatribes at the white working class and German and Im Irish immigrants, those most threatened by free black northern labor and the very idea of black freedom. He employed racial bigotry to craft an image of himself as a defender of democracy and the working man, and in an all too familiar approach, presented himself as an influential and successful businessman with their best interests in his heart. To Van Every, God brought African American people to America for good reason, quote, as cooperating partners of the whites. We are as essential to each other as boys on the opposite ends of a seesaw. As he explained in his 1866 pamphlet, uh, Six Species of Men, God, as depicted in Genesis, had created the white race as the superior race, but also created lower orders of mankind. He rejected this idea, the traditional idea of human unity, and asserted that God had created mankind just as he recreated the, the animal world with groups or families, each of these composed of a certain number of species. Thus, people from Africa are not, quote, colored white men, but rather an altogether, altogether different species of human, just as there were different species of birds. The creator had so plainly marked the inferiority of the African in at least six different ways, in color, figure, hair, features, languages, and brain. Uh, he, in, in one of his books, he uh, presented a picture, excuse me, of, of the archetypal white, uh, white man and, and African, and the white man always had this enormous thick beard, and, the, and as he wrote in his book, the uh, uh, this, this thick, dense beard was evidence of white man's superiority. He could only manage a few chin whiskers. <laughs> now, see, he's before in the 1850s? Yes, 50s, right through Reconstruction. Yeah. <clears throat> they were inferior beings, but ones designed by God to do the white man's work. But he was not a slave. Van Every did not recognize the term and considered the condition of African Americans in the South to be their natural state. There were no more slaves than oxen or horses. They did the work that God and nature intended for them. He saw them as essential, quote, the happiest conjunction that ever occurred in human affairs. Their presence allowed for the construction of white equality, and no white equality could exist without them. Thus, Van Every could present himself as an ultra-democrat and a violent racist simultaneously. And in fact, this was the basis for his appeal. Through pamphlets, newspapers, books, and this terrifically amazing marketing campaign he engaged in, he reached into every acre of the nation's political landscape, taking white supremacist principles to everyone concerned with the political struggles that roiling the nation, especially after the Civil War, and ones that would define the future. And it was that future he sought to shape, as the guns of Appomattox had 
had hardly quieted, his publishing house brought out Rushmore Horton's school textbook, a youth's history of the great civil war in the United States, his effort to reshape the narrative of the sectional crisis and the war's legacy. I did my best to find out where this book was used, and the only place I found was in Boston. <laughs> this book has been written in the cause of truth, it began. In fact, a youth's history is part of a long line of political tracks stretching from the 18th century to the present day. Ones that feast on a paranoid style merged with conspiratorial fears. It argued that the United States always had been uh, a war, the United States as a society had been a war between, quote, those who do not believe in the people and wanted a strong central government to control them and those who wanted the people to control the government. Abraham Lincoln, thus, was but one more in a long line of tools of British Tories who had declared war on the democratic principle. Republicans, under the control of Great Britain and its monarchists, used the British, quote, popular delusion about Negroes to gain political power. For Horton and Van Every, Lincoln and the abolitionists had conspired to carry out the, quote, British free Negro policy, a pet measure of all kings and despots of Europe. To do so, Lincoln assumed dictatorial powers to realize this abolitionist delusion. This book was used in the South, promoted by the um, Daughters of the Confederacy well into the uh, <clears throat> early 20th, I mean, 1920s. Within such a racialized context, we can begin to see why our nation's textbooks have failed so pathologically to incorporate African Americans into the mainstream of our history. As the Southern Poverty Law Center has recently shown, even when textbooks are inclusive, the teaching usually fails to address these issues of slavery and race. Such has always been the case. Noah Webster's 1832 History of the United States proved distressingly typical of history textbooks published before the Civil War. The Connecticut-born Webster of dictionary fame cared nothing for the history of slavery or of African Americans. Recalling uh, James Baldwin's opening words, I would remark, Webster wrote, that of the woolly-haired Africans who constitute the principal part of the inhabitants of Africa, there is no history and there can be none. That race has remained in barbarism from the first ages of the world. Their country has never been explored very fully by civilized man. For Webster, Puritans, especially Connecticut Puritans, where he was from, were the country's founding fathers. His book made only passing mention of settlements below Mason-Dixon and completely ignored the rise of slavery. American history for Webster was the record of his Puritan forebearers and no others. Thus, for the next two centuries, the standard of whiteness in history had been set. Much to my astonishment, no American history textbook before 1860, actually, uh, there was one, ever mentioned the name of an abolitionist or acknowledged the existence of the abolitionist movement. Given how the Compromise of 1850 rocked, so rocked the country, and bonded abolitionism to free speech and connected basic constitutional rights, uh, this is ast was astounding to me. If slavery was mentioned at all, the discussion focused on Congress and political leaders like Henry Clay and Daniel Webster. For this generation, uh, for this generation of textbook authors, uh, hi history took place in European co exploration, colonization, the revolution, constitution forming, uh, political parties, and then each successive uh, presidential administration. This was a format that almost all of them followed with every paragraph in the book numbered. From a reader's perspective, this approach proved onerous and at times oppressive. For example, William Swinton's 17, 1872 First Lessons in Our Country's History, aiming to combine simplicity with sense, clearly proved intolerable to one student who stabbed the copy I read at the Gutman Library with a sharp implement right through the back cover and halfway through the book. <laughs> a few texts could be innovative, such as Thomas 
Howland Mumford's, Mumford's 1856, The Child's First History, a breezy colloquy between a little girl named Madge, her sister Anne, and their aunt. Their discussions with precious little actual history focused on Native Americans never mentioned a word about slavery or African Americans. The Connecticut-born Samuel Griswold Goodrich, who gained enormous fame as Peter Parley, claimed to have published 170 different books, selling 7 million copies. His enormously popular Pictorial History of the United States, originally published in 1843, sold 500,000 copies. The 1866 edition, published after his death, simply tacked on a new chapter about the Civil War to the old edition and uh, somehow neglected to, to mention that slavery had ended. Charles A. Goodrich, his, uh, Goodrich, his brother, and William H. Seavey's History of the United States of America for Use in Schools, first published in 1858 and then expanded in 1867, followed that same format. Uh, it did disapprove of the institution of slavery, but it never mentioned any abolitionist, except John Brown, who they said was insane. The book lacked any coherent discussion of the beginning of Reconstruction. There are important exceptions to this pattern uh, of white supremacy that appeared after the Civil War, shaped by the war, the abolition of slavery, and radical Reconstruction. But many textbooks published after the 1880s proved far more disappointing far more disappointing than the earlier ones. Even authors who offered very sympathetic views of the abolitionists and treated John Brown quite dispassionately revealed their deep prejudice when they dealt with the history of Reconstruction. Inevitably, and I can't emphasize this <laughs> too much, inevitably the worst chapter of almost every textbook published before the mid-1960s, rendered Reconstruction uh, based on popular authors uh, such as Claude Bowers, George Fort Milton, James Truslow Adams, uh, but especially uh, William A. Dunning from the 1890s. Dunning, more than anyone, succeeded in having the country define Reconstruction, quote, as a synonym for bad government. He and other Northern scholars made sure that Americans understood Reconstruction as a period when, quote, Negroes exercised an influence in political affairs out of all relation to their intelligence or property, even proportion to their numbers. Nauseatingly and relentlessly, these texts repeated the phrase ignorant Negroes to describe the freed people who struggled to find a future amid the embattled landscape and intractable resistance of Southern whites. Indeed, reading our textbook history of Reconstruction from 1900 to about the mid-1960s is a shocking immersion in historical distortion white arrogance and racial domination, black incapacity, and nostalgia for the sweet days of slavery. How sweet? Arthur C. Perry and Gertrude Price's 1914 two-volume grammar school history textbook explained the life of slaves by employing a colorful image of, ne quote, Negroes at the cabin door after a day's work quote, getting together for a rollicking time. They presented slavery as a kind of summer camp where people of African descent, quote, lived easy, lived careless, easygoing lives. They were a childlike people with no sense of responsibility, from the little pickaninnies to the oldest aunties and mammies. The authors wrote that, slave, that slaves lived contented lives and, quote, were better off than they would have been if free to shift for themselves. Typical of the pattern, Price and Perry were New Yorkers, not Southerners. The latter, a PhD superintendent of schools and the former, a New York City public school teacher. Fremont Worth's, now this one really kills me, Fremont Worth's The Development of America included an image of such ecstatic slaves. 
the Illinois Bur born Worth, received his PhD from the University of Chicago and became a professor at the famed Peabody College of Teachers uh, in Nashville. And his book, first published in 1937, was reprinted throughout the 1950s. Similarly, Thomas Marshall's 1930 textbook that I had mentioned earlier, uh, riveted in the student's mind Van Every's notion that people of African descent were best suited for and thrived in the South's labor system, overseen by the kindest of masters. The Negro of plantation days, he wrote, was usually happy. He was fond of the company of others and liked to sing, dance, crack jokes, and laugh. He admired bright colors and was proud to wear a red or yellow bandana. He was never in a hurry and always ready to let things go until the morrow. Most of the planters learned that not the whip, but loyalty based on pride, kindness, and rewards brought the best results. Uh, textbooks were written by Southerners. There were a few during this earlier period. Uh, the first, perhaps, came out in 1850, and others would emerge, some authored by women. But if a southern school district wished to avoid the influence of Yankeeism, they could assign one of the many state histories that were produced. Uh, in South Carolina, for instance, the teacher could, could use uh, one that was originally published in 1893, uh, another in 1906, or they could go back to uh, the 19th century uh, and, and uh, employ William Gilmore Sims's history of South Carolina. And in fact, his granddaughter updated that, that 19th century textbook to include uh, right up past the First World War. Chapman, following in the wake of Van Every, depicted the introduction, um, oh, Chapman is John A. Chapman, who wrote School History of South Carolina. Uh, depicted the introduction of African slavery in the Western Hemisphere, quote, as an act of humanity to relieve Native Americans from onerous labor, especially in South American mines. White made sure that students understood that in South Carolina, Negroes worked the rice fields because they could labor without injury to themselves, and whites could not. Moreover, he wrote, without these workers, there would be no Carolina rice. He rarely employed the term slave and preferred terms like African or Negro laborers, just like the Texans. Modern baby boomers who lived in Virginia or in the suburbs of the nation's capital likely saw few US history textbooks and instead received their high school history lessons from a book like uh, the 1957 Virginia History, Government, and Geography guaranteed to conform to white standards by the state's, quote, History and Government Textbook Commission. The volume closely followed Jim Crow and Van Avery versions of slavery in the past. Slavery, the book's three authors asserted, proved a great benefit for whites and a godsend for blacks. And illiterate people, quote, who knew nothing of Christianity or civilization and learned both as slaves and adapted quote, easily to Virginia work and climate. In this way, the authors wrote, Negroes played an important part in the development of Virginia. Just as Van Every had asserted, the text described Negroes as, quote, the best answer to the need for labor in the tidewater. The slave trade, which enriched Yankees, they were always quick to point out, represented no great burden to Africans who arrived on specially designed ships with, quote, many little cubby holes or cells to stay in during that long voyage to America. Their labors in Virginia, quote, did not hurt them, and they benefited enormously from en enslavement by learning trades. And they enjoyed, quote, the work and play of the plantations. In his new home, the Negro was far away from the spears and war clubs of enemy tribes. And he had better food, a better house, better medical care than he did in Africa. And they wrote, he was comforted by a religion of love and mercy. George Washington was held up as the standard of the typical Virginia slave master. And he 
allegedly, according to this account, offered his human property, quote, sweetened tea, broths, and sometimes a little wine. Moreover, masters proved wise leaders who would never harshly punish slaves and, a, and only occasionally whip them, much in the way an adult would whip a disobedient child. As reflected by the works of Van Every, Webster, and others, the most damaging volumes were written by Northerners. Gertrude and John, and John Southworth, two Indiana teachers, one a junior college professor and the other a prep school teacher published the story of our America, a text that spoke only openly about our America and left no question as to who our was. The text adopted by the state of Indiana for the seventh and eighth grades built upon decades of scholarship scorning the Reconstruction era. The Southworth used this image of galloping Klansmen lifted directly from D.W. Griffith's 1915 Birth of a Nation to illustrate how the Klan and similar groups heroically defeated corrupt carpetbag and scalawag governments and their Negro tools to restore respectable whites to their justly dominant position. And this book came out in 1951. An author's gender, like northern birth, also made absolutely no difference in the way race and reconstruction appeared in the school books. Helen F. Giles, a teacher in New, York's, uh, <clears throat> New York City's Horace Mann Elementary School and was affiliated uh, with Columbia University, crafted a sixth grade US history textbook that encapsulated all the worst features of reconstruction historiography and offered it just for the young. After the war, she began, the South lay prostrate. She had read her James Shepard Pike's 1874 vile history of Reconstruction and even quoted it anonymously. With buildings destroyed, farms ruined, rail lines torn up, and quote, young women dressed in black. While whites suffered so terribly, freed slaves roamed the countryside, believing, quote, they would never have to work again. Instead, they stole and plundered. Just one week, Giles asserted, one town arrested 150 Negroes for thieving. Even worse, she wrote, they were insulting to white people. With Negro, with, uh, sorry, with Yankees in control, Southern governments became corrupt filled with Yankee carpetbaggers and ignorant Negroes, again, her, her language, mostly black or brown, some of the type rarely seen outside the Congo. Mingling with Negroes, we see the ferret-faced carpetbaggers eager for spoils. It gets worse. The University of California's John D. Hicks is remembered for his 1931 study, The Populist Revolt. I read that in graduate school, and I wondered, well, how come there weren't any blacks mentioned in that? Well, there was two sentences. Now I know why. His 1943 textbook, A Short History of American Democracy, used in colleges and high schools, described slavery as, quote, by and large, a distinct advance over their lot that would have befallen them had the slave remained in Africa. Besides, Hicks remarked, where else could a people so untutored enjoy picnics, barbecues, singing and dancing? Slave religion, he wrote, was extremely picturesque and their moral standards sufficiently latitudinarian to meet the needs of a really primitive people. Heaven to the Negro was a place of rest from all labor, the fitting reward of a servant who obeyed his master and loved the Lord. Cohabitation without marriage was regarded as perfectly normal and a certain amount of promiscuity was taken for granted. Slave women rarely resisted the advances, of white, the advances of white men as their numerous mulatto progeny abundantly testified. At its website, the University of California at Berkeley still recalls Hicks' enormous influence, classes with over 500 students, and the impossibility, their words, of estimating the number of students whose knowledge of American history has been built on the Hicks histories, but it is certainly an immense number. <clears throat> 
that such rabid fiction could pass for history in the 1940s or at any other time remains shocking. But this kind of textbook history continued to influence generation after generation of students, ignoring counter-narratives, especially the work of prodigious African-American scholars like John Wesley Cromwell, George Washington Williams, Carter G. Woodson, and of course, W.E.B. Du Bois. Not until the 1960s did a new generation of black and white scholars begin, and I mean emphasize, begin, to transform our understanding of the past and the African-American place in it. One cannot overemphasize the impact of these school textbooks or modern electronic resources or the teachers who use or abuse them. As the influential historian and author Henry Adams reminds us in his famed book, The Education of Henry Adams, parents give life, and a killer take a life, but the deed stops there. A teacher affects eternity. You can never tell where his influence stops. Thanks. Thank you. Questions, Thank sir? You. Yes. yes. I'm supposed to wait for a mic. Oh. Thank you. This is great, Donald. And as you know, I'm. I read this book in blurb, and Abby came up with a great idea that we're buying a copy today for each of the fellows. So, hey. Ooh. Merry Christmas. Well, thank you. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yes, There'd be a small fee for certain people. <laughs> <laughs> so, if I want, well, I have two questions. Yep. One um, about the, um, I was trying to think, if I were the, you know, in charge of white supremacy, right, the, the factory of white supremacy, would it have been more urgent to manufacture the narrative over and over again before the Civil War or after the Civil War? So that's the first one. Well, I'm sorry, would, would it have been more? More important, more urgent to manufacture this yeah. image, right? Because remember, what you're trying to do is make it natural. You're trying to naturalize it so that it's just part of the air, a first grader breathes and a middle school person breathes. So, yeah. you know, it, it's a war. So was the war more urgent before the Civil War or was it more urgent after with the, the, when black men, um, but just so most of you know this, but just so everyone knows, um, until the ratification of the 15th Amendment, black men could only vote in the North in five of the six New England states, not in Connecticut, and in the state of New York if um, you satisfied a $250 proper, property. And they, and they lost the right to vote in Pennsylvania in the 1830s. Yes, right. Yeah. So, oh, um, sorry. you know, the, getting, getting the vote, and black men in the South, former slaves, got the right to vote three years before free black men in the North got the right to vote in all those other states, except for Wisconsin and Iowa, which are little funny exceptions. Uh, but 90% of all black people lived in the South until 1910, too. So... Anyway, what just off the top of your head. And the second is, yeah. how can I go back? I have my, the favorite, my favorite course of my whole life was a world history course in the fifth grade. And I've always, when I learned about Hammurabi and Nebuchadnezzar and the Hanging Gardens of Babylon and nothing about Africa, of course, except Egypt. But right. I always wanted to go back and find it. So how can I go back and find the textbooks taught in the Davis Free School <laughs> in Piedmont, West Virginia, between 1956 and 1968? Uh, this, uh, <laughs> this, is, this is such an important question, the second one. And I, I want to address this one first, OK? Uh, and I want to because I, I could not have done this book. I would not even have considered doing this. I couldn't have imagined doing this book if it were not for the Special Collections Department at the Gutman Library, where I was. Yeah, well, well, the Gutman Library is the library for the School of Education. And there was, when I started this project five years ago, <laughs> uh, a, a, a special department uh, in the basement that had uh, not just these 3,000 textbooks that I, I looked at, but thousands more related to uh, the history of education, including uh, state pamphlets, reports. Uh, 
on, on schools of on state schools of education. How would you know what they were, were that they existed unless you saw them? Mm. Unless I was confronted by this mass of of textbooks, if I just had a um, uh, a computer screen with a uh, you know with a catalog with an online catalog, what would I have done? I would have looked at a couple of I, I would have searched because I, I knew no titles right of a book. I would have just kind of probed and come up with a few titles, saw what they did, and go on and finish my book that I'd started. Unless you're absolutely confronted by these things, I would never have done this book. So how do I find them? Yeah, good question. Right. <laughs> well, uh, I, I think um, what one should do is start uh, poking at, the, uh, at, at a database, uh, either the... Uh, our catalog or state, say, say West Virginia cat, um, mm -hmm. uh, sources, and um, start searching through state uh, department schools, uh, uh, Department of Schools and Education, and see what databases they have. So there's and a government organized around uh, Mineral County, West Virginia, 1960, that specific? Well, they, they, unfortunately, they disbanded the entire department. Yeah, but the books are still there. No. What did they do? Throw them away? They put them off campus. Yeah, they're in storage. They're in storage. No, but they're still a right. I mean, you digitally. can access if you yeah. know what they are. You can access them. Yes. You can't see them. But you can't see them. You, can, you right. Yeah. But, but but can you search? I'm just looking for the search terms. Right. You can't right. do yeah. do. yeah. Uh, um. I'm not sure. Okay. Yeah, I'm not All sure. All right. And yeah, yeah. You, you you can search under West Virginia in education, and some of those would well, I think will eventually come up. Okay. Yeah. And my first question about the uh, before I, I get to that, I Go ahead. wanted to add to your answer, which was yeah. um, I became interested in what I learned when I was in Georgia. So I did research, and you can find online, I'm guessing West Virginia was a state adoption uh, state. So in Georgia, there's still state adopted textbooks. And so I found every state adopted textbook from 18, excuse me, 1880s through the 19, through current day. Yeah. And I went on eBay and purchased original copies of every single textbook used in Georgia history from the 1880s all the way through. Yeah. It, they're on eBay. So yeah. if, you, if you can find online a list of state adopted West Virginia textbooks, okay. you'll find the text on, on eBay. Great, yeah. thank you. Yeah, it's urgency. I think that, that's the, the key word. And I think, um, if, if we're only concerned with urgency, then I think probably the post-war period is the matter. But the thing is, influence, if we, we, if we replace that word with influence, then they, they have equal, both periods have equal weight in terms of their importance. Uh, and, and this is essentially because of what I learned through Van Every, because of the centrality of the presence of African Americans in creating white democracy. There's a there was a fascinating um, uh, little anecdote uh, in Gunnar Meidel's um, Amer the American Dilemma, okay, 1944, and uh, that's where um, the idea of of caste was first proposed. Uh, that, um, that African Americans represented a, a special caste in, in the culture. Um, but uh, Meidel, or one of his uh, many researchers, uh, had um, interviewed countless people across the, the North and South. And they interviewed, I think it was a family in Pennsylvania, and they talked to an eight year old girl. And they were asking her a, a, about her relationship with African Americans. And she told them that 
an African-American family had lived next door or near them, and they moved. And so they asked her, well, what was your reaction? She was, she was angry that they had moved. Now, she said, who are we better than? So that, along with Van Everey's um, explanation of the role of, of Africa, as he perceived it, the role of African Americans in creating white American democracy is reaffirmed in the 20th century. Uh, there's equal weight in both, I think. Yeah, yeah. Questions, comments? Uh, go ahead. Oh, oh, I, I, Thank you. Mike Chick, Mike Chick. Can I go? Yeah. Hi, thank you so much, Professor. That was a great presentation. Um, I have two questions. The one following up from what Professor Gates just asked with regards to uh, the difference between the urgency between the pre and post slavery. And I, and I wonder importantly, what is the difference conceptually when we don't call it the Civil War simply and specifically speak about pre and post slavery? Um, what that means, because it's not just a civil war over secession, as you're saying, specifically it is over the question of slavery. And I'm thinking, of course, within black studies, you know, people like Saidia Hartman, uh, following on from Fanon, speak about the fact that slavery or the slave is the ground on which civil society is built on, right? So what happens specifically for whiteness when we no longer have black people as the figure of the slave, or at least illegally the slave? Um, and I'm saying this also I'm thinking about the fact that, for example, Du Bois speaks about the fact that white supremacy, the discovery of personal whiteness, is a very specifically late 19th century, um, 20th century phenomenon. So what's happening yeah, in that post-slavery moment? Yeah, but it isn't. Well, this is... Clearly it isn't. Uh, well, I'm saying as you're describing it, post-slavery, yeah. it seems to be a very specifically post-slavery phenomenon, this idea of white supremacy, as you were talking about with Tom... Um, with every the, I, the specific sort of conceptualization of white supremacy in this instantiation is a post-slavery phenomenon. Well, it, it, yeah, it has it has a unique um, importance in the post-slavery world because the controlling factor of of uh, servitude is no longer operative. So uh, the the nation comes up with a series of uh, endless controlling factors to control the lives of African Americans, whether in the South or the North, okay? Uh, but is, uh, is that any different than the controlling factors of African Americans previous to the Civil War? Well, I mean, I think there is, a, as I was explaining, uh, you know, to, to Skip's answer, there is an urgency um, that one uh, perceives because of the end of the institution of slavery. Um, but there is also an urgency in the pre-Civil War. I, I, let me replace that. There's not an urgency, but there's a recognition of its centrality in the pre Civil War era to control the behavior of African Americans, and, and this is why Van Every is so important to create American white democracy, and that Van Every argues that without the African presence, uh, without the without that element which. Uh, contrast, which whites perceived as contrasting to themselves, that American democracy as we understand it would never have developed, that the, the European uh, class system would have succeeded, and that democracy as we know it would never have developed, and there would be class war among whites, and that the black presence eliminated that possibility. That's a Tony Morrison came up with the same conclusion. It's okay. yeah, so I don't see one as more important, and they have equal importance. It's different, but I think of equal weight. Yeah. All right. So the second question is around this 
Africanist presence. And so thinking about black studies where there's the argument, which I buy, that there's a difference between white supremacy and anti-blackness, and not, not just anti-black racism, but specifically anti-blackness. And what would that mean for your analysis if we're thinking about white supremacy and anti-blackness as separate but related concepts? <laughs> well, um, th this, is, this is such a freighted and, and um, complex question because, in fact, races don't even exist. We have racism, but we don't have races. races it's a figment of white imagination uh, created in the late 18th and 19th century. So I, I, I'm not sure how I can answer that. I'm not sure there is an answer to, to that. Um, if, if, if you're concerned about you know, modern attitudes, contemporary attitudes, and um, the future, I, given what I have seen in my lifetime, there is clearly dramatic change, despite Trump and, and all that. Um, it's a struggle because of this legacy that I've just outlined, and it will continue to be a struggle. I don't see an end to it anytime soon. Yeah. Two questions. Uh, the first one was, could you repeat the very last sentence of your presentation? That was powerful, and I was trying to get that. <laughs> the very last sentence. It was about a teacher, and then. Oh, oh, oh the Henry Adams quote. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's from his famous book, The Education of Henry Adams. Oh, so you took that from somebody. Yeah. All right. Oh, I didn't make it up. Uh, I'm just, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> I, no, no, I, yeah. I, quote, I quoted repeat? him directly. Yeah. Uh, he, he said, uh, p parents give life and a killer may take a life, but his deed stops there. A teacher affects eternity. He can never tell where his influence stops. Gotcha. Yeah. Appreciate that. Sure. Second question was, so this book is about teaching white supremacy and the role that it has played, you know, in educating our nation over the years. Well, it's more than that. More than that. It, it's about the creation of white American identity. Mm -hmm. And the education is the, the educational text, textbooks, are simply a primary means in which that identity was transferred from generation to generation. Gotcha. Yeah. So what role do you think that educators, white educators and white school districts can currently play in unteaching white supremacy yeah. or denouncing white yeah. supremacy? Yeah. Good luck. Um, yeah, it, it, they have a pivotal responsibility. I agree. Um, and many are attempting to fulfill that. However, um, a few years ago, the Southern Poverty Law Center did a study on, on the teaching of, these, of, the, of this subject and what teachers are doing. And it, is, it was so, you can, it's online, it's free, you can download it and read it yourself. Uh, it's so disturbing. You could have the best textbooks in the world. Everybody could have a copy of Eric Foner's textbook, but they don't use it. They won't use it. They won't address these issues. Uh, they're, they're either intimidated, scared, or ill-equipped. Now, um, I start my book with a kind of personal anecdote. Um, I, was, I went to college to become a high school teacher. I can't tell you <laughs> how terrible that system of, education, of teacher education and teacher training is. Um, it was, now, that's a long time ago, and I'm, I would hope things have changed dramatically. But I think from what, I've, what I found and the examples that I gave, these people have no training. They have apparently little contact with people outside their own um, Caucasian worlds. And they don't, they don't know the history. They have no ability to teach it. Um, they have no information. I, apparently, they don't even read the textbooks they're supposed to be using. Um, I, I mean, how could you, how, what teacher in their right mind could have a slave auction in front of the students? I mean, it's, it's so disturbing. What kind of training would they have that will allow such a thing to take place? I don't know. Um, but I have found, uh, and I think I mentioned this uh, in the latter part of the end of the book, um, part of the trouble 
is that, uh, and this was my experience when I was training for teachers, a lot of the teachers who teach history, or what they called social studies, were gym teachers. It's still the case. I can't tell you how many scholars um, who have written memoirs and things have referred to this. Uh, Jim Horton, uh, now, now, now departed, found the same thing. Gym teachers. I mean, would, <laughs> where in your school would you justify um, a science class being taught by a gym teacher? But apparently this can be done with history and social studies. It's still being done. Yeah. Okay, uh, thank you very much. I really appreciate the ways in which you excavated the early parts of the history of the early 20th century and showed the representations of race. I guess my question is, I understand why it's important to chronicle this history, but I'm wondering um, about the resistance um, to this history and how the sort of absence of that almost reifies a kind of white supremacy. So for yep. example, when yep. you talk about the early part of the 19th century, and you talk about this printer that's involved in creating this textbook, there's also African Americans and Freedom's Journal who are writing a different yep. type of history sure. through the use of newspapers. Yep. And so he's not just writing in response to a white supremacist idea, he's writing in response to the fact that Samuel Cornish and John Russ Worm are putting forth a different black image. I'm thinking also of the image when you're sort of presenting white teachers teaching racist images. There's also people like Charlotte 14 Grimke at the time of the Reconstruction period who's actually teaching free children the image of Toussaint L'Overture. I'm thinking about the fact that in the 1990s, I taught at an Afrocentric school in Philadelphia which insisted upon um, a, a curriculum that was absolutely adamantly pro-Afrocentric. So, what I'm saying is not just to say like there's an absence of this and how does that help, but how the absence of this almost and the resistance and not acknowledging the resistance almost reifies white supremacy even more because really what you have um, are efforts um, among various groups to push against this. And so I'm not necessarily sure how um, robust this is. I mean, I know it's robust in certain places and certain times, but there's also been, since the 19th century, a protest against this type of, of, of history, mostly coming out of the black community. Yeah. Uh, I, I think we have to assume there's going to be resistance. There is resistance. I mean, you ever been to Florida? Um, and, it, and it's going to continue. There's no simple answer uh, to this. But I think ceding the ground to governors like the Florida governor uh, will not benefit us. I think we must stay engaged. Um, and if temporarily it inspires um, white supremacists to uh, continue their work, well, what can we do? Silence will only benefit them. Um, yeah. Um, hi, thank you again for the presentation. I'm just wondering how this teaching relates to the teaching of Africa in inverted commas, because- I, I'm uh, sorry, it, it relates to- The teaching mm -hmm. of Africa. Africa, as, okay, know, yep. um, Because obviously, because of the, you, you talked about the, the, the girl saying, who am I going to be better than? And this is better yeah. than narrative. Yeah. And because of the false paradigm of race, Africa is kind of directly linked to African Americans and their perception. So, you know, obviously we spoke about Rodal, and I'm thinking of my own first experience writing for children, in which my publisher then wanted to write some notes about Africa at the back. And one of the things that they had written was that Africans need help with conservation. Right? So I then refused to publish the book unless they let me rewrite the the notes, yep. and I had to give them context about the destruction of um, um, habitat, etc., and why the trophy hunting by Europeans had caused the problem which they were being told they would need to help Africans with. But that kind of thing that happens all the time in children's publishing then creates the notion that Africans need help, and therefore African Americans need help, and therefore, right. so you know, I, I don't know if there are any answers, but right. I, yeah. Well, the first answer is to 
uh, to have students and, and uh, Americans uh, watch Professor Gates's uh, special on the history of Africa. Right. Uh, they would learn quite a bit. Um, I, I, I don't know. I, this is, a, like I said, this is a struggle. And um, including the, the, the history of Africa in, in this um, sort of paradigm does complicate it. Um, and I think would probably going, referring back to, his, to your question uh, that just preceded yours, uh, probably will instill more anxiety uh, in the nation because we are faced right now with a situation where 35% uh, thereabouts of, uh, of the nation um, is in the grips of this identity crisis manifested by, by Trump. Um, and it's not going away. And the more that we present this, my own, you know, like my own view or your view, um, the more anxious they will be because it is, they are seeing themselves as diminishing. And the demographics point that out. The future is, is one of eventually uh, people of European descent being a minority of minorities in the United States. I don't see that as a threat, but a lot of people, 35% of Americans apparently do. So essentially the real struggle is actually now yeah. coming. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Hi, thanks for your work. And I'm just wondering, in the textbooks that you were looking at, when, when are there explicit or implicit references to um, not quite white or future whites, that is to say entering white migrants as a, as a, oh. um, as a reason for um, socializing, as, as a reason for educating whites about um, whiteness. Well, w w w this, this, I think, um, brings up the issue of, of what is whiteness. And I think we have to understand that um, historically, whiteness is a malleable um, definition, that it includes and excludes certain peoples depending upon po time, politics, and geography. For example, um, when Van Every was publishing his work from the mid-1850s uh, through about 1867 or, or 70, okay, uh, he included people who were Jews in the white race. After his passing near the end of the 19th century, few white Americans would have included Jews in the, their definition Oh, well, yeah, no, as a matter of, yes, exactly, because at the end of the 19th century, there's a massive immigration, movement of immigration, uh, and it isn't cut off until the 1920s. Uh, but in the 1920s, this chapter six, I think, in, in the book deals with this. It is a horrific period in American history. Um, it's beginning with the uh, Red Summer of 1919. Red doesn't refer to communists. It refers to blood. Uh, there are over 60 white revolutions, revolts across the United States uh, incinerating black communities from Florida to Chicago. Uh, there is, this is the era in which eugenics becomes part of the American culture. Uh, and it, it is in direct response to the successes of African Americans, number one, and two, the massive immigration that had taken place up until the First World War. So, you, I mean, it's, this whole notion of whiteness, which it's changing as we speak now, in which uh, the uh, Republicans are now willing to accept certain people from South America, who years ago they would have defined as the other and, you know, as white. There, there, 
that the same way that the Irish became white in the 19th century by assaulting African Americans and taking on African Americans, uh, we are seeing the same thing taking place now with certain people f who are fleeing from leftist part, uh, countries in, 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 in um, the Caribbean and South America and being accepted by the Republican Party as white, whereas a few years ago they would never have done so. No. Professor Terry. Uh, thank you for the presentation. Um, I had a question. I was hoping that you might be able to drill down a little bit about the, the pedagogical character of the textbook. So my sense of it, trying to reflect on my own experiences and then some of the things you've said, yeah. is that it's really difficult to convey as a teacher complicated historiographical debates or causal explanations about, you know, why did the Louisiana Purchase unfold the way it did? Why did Shays' Rebellion unfold the way it did? And actually, a, a lot of American education is less invested in that, I think, and more invested in heroic stories. Um, so heroic characters. But that's not new either. <laughs> right. So, so I, I just wanted to hear you say a little bit more about what you noticed about the heroic as you read through textbooks. Are heroes changing? Are the kinds of stories people are telling about what constitutes an American hero changing? Is there anything we can learn about the way the heroic functions as part of um, civic pedagogy through these textbooks? Well, books? yeah, that, that's, that's, a real, that's a good question. Uh, the heroic element in um, the early textbooks was in the uh, European conquest of uh, native inhabitants. That was depicted uh, almost universally. There are a few exceptions before the Civil War because uh, some of the abolitionists um, uh, and some of the reformers were deeply concerned with the treatment that um, Native Americans were receiving in the North, not just in the South, but also in the North. And so some of these textbooks were surprisingly sympathetic to uh, Native American peoples, okay, surprisingly so. The overwhelming majority of them saw them as simple red savages. They had to be eliminated to um, guarantee the success of these heroic Europeans who came to settle in, the, in, um, in the North America. Um, there is in the period from about, uh, from 1865 until uh, about 1900, a, uh, a group of authors, um, I think I mentioned Charles Carlton Coffin being very prominent among them, who, and uh, Elisha Mulford, who didn't write a textbook but wrote a study, a kind of a political science study that became very popular, um, who, who crafted a heroic image of the United States. That Reconstruction was um, at last going to bring about the um, godly republic that we should have created from the beginning. That this was an, op an unprecedented opportunity with the destruction of slavery to create this monumental uh, country dedicated to freedom and liberty, true freedom, true liberty for all. It's an astonishing change in the tone of textbook. Not a lot of these textbooks, but they certainly did exist. And some of them persisted into, into, into the early 20th century and then were just overwhelmed by this flood of uh, rejectionist um, uh, ideology, uh, especially, as I mentioned in the address regarding Reconstruction. Uh, they just turned the tables completely upside down. What had been positive in those books uh, of, of, of Charles Carlton Coffin and others, and Thomas Wentworth Higginson, suddenly became the problem. That was the problem, and to uh, and success was then measured by the success of 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 whiteness. And they're very clear about that. I mean, the white man's history is in capital letters. I mean, you can't avoid it. Um, in modern times, now um, the heroic. I, um, 
if you're asking my personal opinion on, on this, um, I would I, rev I would revert back to this image, uh, this approach that that the uh, textbook authors who benefited from the what they saw as the transformation that Reconstruction promised, that that is the element which is so appealing to me. Um, and, and I think back to when I was a child. Um, I, I did a lot of reading on my own, and those were the kinds of stories. I mean, I, I read uh, God is My Co-Pilot, 30 Seconds Over Tokyo, you know, and I, I read all these things because I grew up after World War II. That was a heroic era for me, and they were people who were defending liberty and freedom around the world. Why not? That's the theme I would fit. I have one more question right there. Thank you. Um, thank you very much for your presentation. I'm looking forward to reading the book. Um, so my question for you is this. I'm wondering, or I'd like to know, what the study of these education texts, what your study of them, changes about our understanding of the history of race. <laughs> What, sorry, repeat that. What does? So, I, I, I don't know enough about the history of education and the history of educational sure. texts, and I'm very fascinated and intrigued by it. Um, and what I'm wondering is what you found that the study of these texts really does to change our understanding of race in this country. Uh, oh, oh, okay. Yeah. Fine. Okay. Wh what it taught me, yeah. okay, when I uh, uh, did this was that, uh, as I mentioned earlier, we need to do, if, if you're asking my opinion, I would say we need to do away with this idea of race altogether. It's a fiction. There's no genetic basis for it. It was all based on observation and white prejudice. They're quite clear about that. Um, so de deal it, just forget it, just drop it and uh, talk about people based on, uh, you know, their, their quote, ethnicity or where, where they're their parents or grandparents was from. I, I just I just think, based on what I have read, based on this experience, I see that this whole concept dividing the world between black and white, that this whole idea of race is at the core of our problem. That it allows, if in fact you acknowledge these things exist, then you're giving justification for white supremacy. Deal way, deal out of the entire structure, of the way we understand people, and and their and their background, um, it's it's a fiction to begin with. So why continue it? And it, yeah, yeah. Well, it doesn't exist. It's a, it's a creation. It's a fiction. It's an agreed upon fiction. There's no genetic basis for it. There are more differences between people of European background than there are between Europeans and Africans. I mean, it's just it's it it is a construct, an intellectual construct that people deliberately set about to create, to place whites at the top and, and people of African descent on the bottom. Donald, you can't just wave a magic wand. No, I know you can't. Yes, you can't. I wish I could. Saying that, I mean, people have been saying what you said for 50 years or longer. Yep. But that's not going, it's not going to go away. And even when you said racism exists, everybody says that, yep. then they say, well, then how could racism exist? We don't have racism. Whatever yes, right. you call it, you can get rid of the word, yep. but still the concept exists and it's not going to go away. As much as we want it to go away, it's not going to go away, it's not going anywhere. It's just not. So what do you do? You can't just keep saying, oh, well, forget, you know, this bogus concept doesn't exist. It doesn't matter if it was a bogus, it exists, it's here. People kill each other in the name of it. Right, yep. So what's your second? <laughs> <laughs> I, I, look, I, I'm always involved in hopeless uh, efforts. Okay, so I don't get. I, I'm not giving up on this. Right. I'm. I'm. I, and I think. Excuse me. If more of us speak out and we make this a central issue in our education, maybe there's a chance of it succeeding. If we don't try, if we don't do it, if we don't teach it, it's never going to happen. I agree. And on that note, I think we should thank Donald Yakovon for. Mm -hmm.
elevator's locked, uh, and it'll only be open unless you buy this brother's book. <laughs> <laughs> um, fellows, please. Uh, okay, yeah. So let's do it.